Once again, welcome home. Welcome home those in the house. Welcome home those that are joining us online. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1 as we continue this teaching series, The King and His Kingdom. The King and His Kingdom. As you're turning there, just a quick recap of chapter 1 verses 1 through 17, we find the genealogy of Jesus. There are three groups of 14 generations. There are 42 generations of natural birth followed by the singular, supernatural, virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's look to verse 18, Matthew chapter 1. The king has come. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See the virgin, verse 23, see the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son. and They will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her. Until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Uh, let's, let's pray again. Would you, would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the text that is before us, the passage of scripture before us. And as Christmas is so fresh on most of our minds, if not everyone, Lord, would you reveal truth from from this passage the truth just jump off the pages and into our hearts and our minds Lord we need your help so we ask this in the name of Jesus for your glory we pray amen the king the king has come Look to verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way, after his mother Mary had been engaged. Pause there, Uh, different translations will read uh, a different word like betrothed, and and that is a a very good word and helpful word, especially in the society that we live in. According to the custom of the day, there were were two stages for a couple to go through in what we uh, call the marital process. The first the first step, the first stage was the betrothal. Uh, they were, he, they were, he, he, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. She was engaged to, to, to Joseph. Now, this, this betro- bet- betrothal was a, a marriage uh, contract. And it was typically arranged by, by the parents. How many of you would want your parents to line you up? You know what I'm saying? Anybody? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe a couple. I don't know. But uh, in this day and age, that, that's what typically happened. And this first step, this first stage could only be broken by divorce. The second was typically some years later. And it was after the marriage feast. After the marriage feast, the the groom would take his wife to his house, to his home. This was the standard, the custom of, of the day. And so Mary had been engaged, betrothed to Joseph, and it was discovered 
before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now, if you need to know what come together means, uh, you can ask somebody next to you or you know, ask somebody later, but uh, kind of put two and two together, and then there you go. But before they came together, you know, before they, before they, they came together, there's this news. Joseph receives this news that Mary is pregnant, and he is not the father. <laughs> there's this news that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know about you. I know, I know me. I can only answer for me. If, if, if my bride was, came to me with this news, I don't even know if I'd have a whole lot of questions. You know, you know what I'm saying here. And, and, and so look, c- c- consider, consider verse 19. Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Now, we know a whole lot more about Mary, right? You read the Gospels. Mary was with Jesus. I mean, she was with Jesus at the, at the cross, you know. But, but, but we don't really know that much about Joseph. But this scripture gives us a little bit of insight, at least to Joseph's character. Because uh, if it was any other kind of a man... Not a good man, uh, a righteous man in this context, meaning one of character, one of reputation. He had a name for himself, established a name for himself. He didn't want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to divorce her secretly, to divorce her quietly. He wouldn't lower his, his standards uh, 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 so I don't know. I mean, just consider this for a moment, fellas. If that's you, you find out this news. I, I don't know what your response is. In this day and age, uh, the response would probably be a little more, you know, like extra, like extra. You be grabbing Mary by her hair, pulling her to the down square and letting the whole world, you know, put her on blast, you know, for what's going on here. But, but Joseph wasn't that kind of a man. We see this from the scripture that he was a man of, had, had character. He was a man of of character. Look at verse 20. But after he had considered these things, an angel from of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. That that reference, son of David, is noteworthy. You can go back to the lineage that we looked at last week to see how important that reference is. That Joseph is found within this genealogy that points to. Jesus being born, the Messiah. And the angel says, don't be be afraid. Take Mary as your wife. I'm thankful that we have the clarity on this scripture. Because if, uh, again, if I was Joseph, things might not have ended up the same. You know what I'm saying? I would need the Lord himself to reveal to me That it was indeed the Holy Spirit of God that has conceived this Christ child within the womb of of Mary. And so the angel appears to Joseph after he had considered these these things. We'll talk just for a moment about decisions. Verse 20, verse 19 Joseph is at a crossroad. There's a decision that's need, that needs to be made. And have you ever paused and considered how you make decisions? Have you ever just taken a step back and how, how do I really process decisions? It's been said, the studies have proven something that, uh, you know, as good as studies can prove, you know, <laughs> leave that to you to decide. But over 10,000 decisions that you and I make every day. A lot of these decisions that we make every day, they're, they're just, they're just, it's who we are, right? They're just part of us. Uh, I told the 9 a.m. crowd uh, that uh, I praise God some of y'all looked at your closet and made a decision. You know what I'm saying? This morning before you came to church. We ain't that kind of church, you know? And so uh, uh, we, we all have decisions that we make every day, multiple decisions, and, uh, but there's even more than we ever even consider. So how do we make the right decision? Have you ever taken a step back and just considered this? How 
Do I make the right decision? See, some, some of you are faced with a decision right here, right now. Some of you came to, came to church, you, you joined online, and, and, and you have a decision that's pressing you, that's weighing down on you, that perhaps you've even come today to pray through that, to worship through that. How do we make the right decision? The, the first would be, would you write this down? Take time. How do you make the right decision? Take time. We see in verse 20, after he had considered these things, thankfully Joseph just didn't rush. He didn't hear this. He didn't receive this information and act on it based on how he immediately felt. Facts over feelings are so important and key to making the right decision. Listen, if we allow our feelings to rule our lives, we will, I will, you will make decisions with lasting implications that affect future generations. A lot of times we just make these decisions, bam, 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 and we don't consider, we make them so fast that we don't consider who is it going to impact because we're doing what we think is best for, for, for me. And that is often not the right thought process because there are generations to come that will be impacted based on your decisions that you make today and each day. And so how do we make the right decision? Take time. Oftentimes we, we rush. We rush the decision. You know, you think about the last decision that you had to make. Uh, maybe, maybe it was you. You were standing before your closet. And you're like, I'm running out of time here. Even the 1030 crowd, I'm running out of time here and, and I got to throw something on. You know, uh, you, you all look wonderful, by the way. And so, uh, but how often do we rush the decisions that are before us? Hey, you want to make the right one? Take time. Take a step back. Take time. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2 says, even zeal is not good without knowledge. And the one who acts hastily sins. The New Living Translation says, haste makes mistakes. Haste makes mistakes. You might want to write that down. How do we make the right decision? Take time. We see that Joseph, after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Second, how do we make right decisions? You're going to love this, especially on a Sunday, a cool weather outside. Take a nap. Take a nap. Write that down. I am serious. You're wondering, is that real? It's on the screen. I'm that serious, you know? Take a nap. <laughs> Take, how do we make right decisions? Take a nap. You wouldn't believe people that I have had the privilege to serve as pastor, sit with, listen to, and they're trying to make, I mean, life-changing decisions, and they are absolutely worn out. That is one of the worst times to make a decision. If you have a decision before you today, go home and take a nap. <laughs> go home and rest. Now, we see it in the text here. I don't know another way that Joseph is dreaming other than sleeping. <laughs> so uh, even like the daydream, I would consider that a beautiful thing. Just to sit back, relax, fall in that kind of a state where you're able to rest. Take a, take a nap. You got to make a decision. You want to make the right decision. Take time. Take a nap. Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. Write that reference down. Exodus 33, 14 says, and he replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. My presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Some of you are so tired today. I mean, maybe the best thing you can do is just fall asleep right now. <laughs> Take a step back and rest in the presence of God before you rush a decision that will impact future generations. How do we make the right decision? Take time. Take a nap. Next, take a word. 
from the Lord. Would you write that down? Take a word from the Lord. If we're going to make the right decision, we need to hear from God. It saddens me how quickly people run to all these other voices than the only voice that really matters, the only voice that's above them all. That is the Lord our God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has created you, the one who knows every detail about you. Church, let's run to him. And let's not leave until we hear from him. You're trying to make a decision today. Don't you dare make it on your limited understanding and your limited wisdom and your limited experience. That's all of us, by the way. Somebody saying, well, you're criticizing me, Tim. No, no, that's all of us. Starting with me right here. There's only one above them all. It's the Lord, our God. And we need to, we need to hear from him. We need to take a word from the Lord. We challenge you week after week, each day to open up this word. It would be a tragedy if the only time this word was opened is on Sundays when we gather for worship. This word uh, should be opened each day of our lives so that we know the truth. And as Jesus said, the truth will set us free. If you need help, uh, guidance of, 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 of where, where, where should I go with a reading plan? What should I be reading? What should I be meditating on? What should I be memorizing? Hey, see an elder in our next step area when all this is said and done. Send us a message. If you're online, send us a message. We produce a reading plan every month. It's in the back. It's, it's in our next step area. And, 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 and that is released the last Sunday of each month so that you're ready for day one of the month. We don't want anyone going, uh, uh, doing this life without digging into God's word, which is the only truth, by the way. This is the authority for our lives. And if I'm going to make the right decision, I need, to, I need to take a word from the Lord. Psalm 85, verse 8, the psalmist says, I will listen to what God will say. Oh, I love that. I pray that's true for you and I today. I will listen to what God will say. Surely the Lord will declare peace to his people, his faithful ones, and not let them go back to foolish ways. We've all been there. We've all done that. We all have the marks, the scars from the foolish ways of living, trying to do life on our own. Let's take a word from the Lord. How do we make the right decision? Next, write this down. Take courage. Take courage. Joseph has this encounter in this dream with an angel. And what is the angel? The angel, first of all, confirms the truth. Hey, you're not mistaken here. This really did happen. I, I, I mean, I wish I could have been there for that conversation. Joseph. Like even in the dream, communicating with the angel. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, but this really happened. And so the angel of God confirms what is true in this dream. Before he does that, he says this, don't be afraid. Hey, once you have heard from the Lord, on that right decision... Take courage. Don't, don't look back. Hold on to what you know is right according to the word of God and what you believe that is in line with his will, which his will will never uh, contradict his word. And so there's some clarity there for all of us. But take courage. Don't, don't be afraid. I can't tell you how many times myself and, and people I've met with are second guessing the decision. Once you've heard from the Lord, take courage and go. Hold on. Don't be afraid. What do we have to be afraid of? What can mere men do to me? Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 says, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord, your God, is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. You hear that? No matter what you're facing today, no matter what challenge, no matter what decision, take courage. The Lord, your God, will never leave you 
nor abandon you. Lastly, I would encourage you to, to take hold of truth. It's one to take a word from the Lord, to, to look firstly to the Lord, to hear from, from him, to spend time studying his, his, his word. Uh, but take hold of, of the truth. See, Joseph had to do this. This is what the angel of the Lord said. The one conceived in Mary's womb is the one who will forgive all sins. Your sins have been forgiven through this one. And he is Emmanuel, God with us. We're going to see that Joseph got up and he obeyed. We're gonna, we, we know that. We've already read it. We've already seen it. We know the, how the story ends. But, but I mean, do we really know to the, to the core? Joseph had a decision to make. It had to, he had to take courage. And he had to take hold of the truth. Second. Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, In every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. I want to encourage you, church, today. Take every thought captive. All those thoughts that are running through your mind, Take them captive in obedience to Christ. God, is this a God glorifying thing or a me, me glorifying thing? If it's a me glorifying thing, remove it. Remove it from me. If there's any pride, remove it. Fill me up with humility. Help me to glorify you, to be about uh, uh, your, your name, your fame. Live for your glory. Look to verse 21. She Angel says, she will give birth to a son. You are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Listen, this child, this child born to Mary is to be given that name as a designation of his function, which is to save his people from their sins. Look to verse, look to verse 22. Now all this, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. All, all of this took place. The birth of Christ took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. By the Lord through his prophet. We find this verse 23 in, in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7 is this prophecy that has been given some 700 years before this moment. 700 years. Let that just sink in. 700 years prior, there was this prophecy. And it's fulfilled with the birth, the arrival of Jesus. But context is always helpful. The, the context of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, what we read in verse 23 of Matthew 1, is an encounter between the prophet Isaiah and King Ahaz of Judah. The prophet Isaiah, a prophet was a man of God who spoke on behalf of God to the people of God. The prophet, they, 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 they were hated people because they were continually calling the people of God back to God. And so the context of Isaiah chapter 7 is there is a, a war that's, that's happening. A war from 735 to 732 BC when Syria and Israel attacked Judah. The northern attacks uh, the southern. And King Ahaz, who is he? Well, King Ahaz, if you recall, is a wicked king. He is the one that brought idolatry back to Judah. He is the one that sacrificed his son on the altar of Molech. I mean, that's how wicked this king is. Listen to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10. Scripture says, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, listen, house of David, 
It is not enough for you to try the patience of men. Will you also try the patience of my God? What's happening here? Isaiah rebuked Ahaz for not trusting the Lord. Isaiah promised Ahaz that God would protect Judah and the royal seed. The royal seed, of course, is the line, the lineage that leads to Jesus ultimately. Ahaz wants nothing to do with Isaiah. Isaiah tells Ahaz to ask for a sign. Ahaz declines, but he receives a sign anyway. (laughs) Jerusalem and the royal family were under siege. There's this war. But Isaiah expresses there's a hope. There's hope with a promise. He declares that the Lord will give Ahaz a sign. And again, this this sign, this promise was given some 700 years before the birth of Christ. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. In the midst of this war, God promised, God promised a savior. God promised a king who, was, who will be worthy of the throne to reign over all kings and all kingdoms. The only one to where forgiveness would be made available for all mankind. God will protect his interests. The lineage of King David to the birth of King Jesus We read it. We see it through history. The birth of Jesus is a sign of God's presence. God is with us. God is with us. Look back to Matthew 1, verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he's taking a nap, doing a godly thing. Uh, He did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. He did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. Joseph wakes up after hearing from the Lord, and he walks in obedience. You know, we uh, often put our hope in other people, places, other kings, even kingdoms, when the king of kings has already come. I want to challenge you today, as I've challenged myself, where do you find yourself today? The different decisions, challenges, start of the new year, thinking about your future. Where do you find yourself today? Some of you, perhaps this year is off to the greatest year of your life. And as a church, we celebrate that. We praise God for that for you. But there's others that are and some pretty significant battles that you will have no understanding of. Where do you find yourself today? Do you find yourself alone? Sad? Confused? Hopeless? Where do you find yourself today? And would you be honest enough to just lay it before the king. Say, so God, this is, this, is, this is where I'm at. This is what I feel. But I want to lay it before. No one would come to the king as he sits on his throne without bowing down before him. Would you have the boldness and the courage and honesty to surrender whatever it is before the king today. The hurts, the feelings, the thoughts, the conflicts, whatever it might be. And will you believe today that the king has come? The king has come 
He's come for you. He's come for me. He's, he's come for all humanity. And with his coming, he has brought hope and peace, forgiveness, provision, a future. The king has whatever your need is. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? If you're online with us, would you do the same? Just pause, just take a step back. Just take a step back and consider this response today. Where do you find yourself today? Would you be honest before God? Right here, right now, would you pray? Knowing he hears you, knowing he cares, knowing he loves you, knowing he has a future for you. I don't know what kind of lies you've bought into today, this week. We know the evil one and he's prowling around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants nothing but death and destruction for you. But Jesus Christ has come. The king has come so that there might be life. <laughs> And so would you just surrender right now? If you're in the house, you're online, wherever, you, would you just surrender it over to him? Whatever it is, whatever that battle is, would you just surrender it over to him? The king. Maybe there's someone here that's never surrendered over to Jesus. And as people are praying all across this place, maybe there's someone here that's never surrendered over to Jesus for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins. And today would be the day. Today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day. As people are praying, perhaps this is your prayer. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and you are the Savior. I trust in you completely. Forgive me of all my sins. Help me to not look back to the past, but look ahead to the future that is found in you, Jesus. I believe in you. I trust you with everything that is in me. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer, would you thank him? All across this place, in the house, online, would you thank him? If that's your prayer, 